good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure now to conduct this uh, session. Uh, and uh, our guest speaker is uh, Professor Fernando Lopes da Silva. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he's a very uh, distinguished professor, and uh, I would just, I'm going to make a very short introduction because we're short of time. Uh, he has done his medical degree in Lisbon, and then he has had, as I said, a very distinguished career, um, and uh, finally uh, uh, based uh, in the Netherlands, uh, he has become an emeritus professor at the uh, University of Amsterdam. Uh, and, um, and he's now uh, here, he's going to talk to us uh, about a, a very interesting uh, theme, uh, which is going to be followed by at least one uh, professor from the University of Porto, Claudio Sunkel uh, from ICBAS, and uh, I hope as well uh, that one professor from the Faculty of Arts, Sofia Migens, uh, which uh, she is not here, but of course she didn't know that we anticipated the, uh, uh, the session as well, so we hope that she'll turn up eventually. So uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much for uh, your introduction. I thought that one of the themes that I would like to deal with here is this question of uh, what are research-intensive universities and some of the challenges that are put to these universities and especially according to the European perspective. We just discussed a little bit about America um, and uh, I, I, I really would like to concentrate on the European perspective, which I think is very specific and uh, not everything is, uh, has to go according to the, to the American model. Um, I am very uh, pleased to have heard uh, Stephen Collin today uh, not only because I always like to hear very good English, uh, which really is ex ex exceptional good English, uh, but also uh, because he covered a lot of things that I will also to dis discuss here, although much more, uh, much, uh, let's say less in the philosophical way, but more in the practical applications, uh, the political way, let's say. So I would like to start with the concept of research university, and then I'll go through uh, these different points. And uh, due to time, I will not go in all the details, but just to give you an idea that the concept of the university as we know now in Europe, but also in the United States, I may say, is a, a holistic uh, concept of a combination of research and learning. And this was the concept that was uh, put forward by von Humboldt in Berlin in 1810. So we are already more than a century ago. And, um, and of course, I mean, this has been followed by many different universities, both in Europe and the United States, but not by all. For instance, in France, at the same time, it was the custom to divide research institutes from universities teaching. And uh, this was the creation of the Grandes Écoles, which still today exists, although, of course, things have changed since then. Two key principles, I think, are important to, to stress. The one is the union of teaching and research. In the work of the individual scholar or scientist with a heavy assignment of research in a teaching ecosystem. And the second one is the essential role of intellectual freedom in research and teaching. According to von Humboldt, this means Eisamkeit und Freiheit. So union and uh, freedom. And uh, in this thing, we have, of course, uh, evolved I mean, from this model. We can just, to, for the sake of, uh, of uh, simplicity, consider there are, in general, three models today at universities. One is the, what they call the strong integrationist model, which threads the close connection between research and teaching at the individual level of the scholar, of the scientist, of the teacher. And that is actually the Humboldt, the von Humboldt model. Then the mild integrationist model that assures integration of research and teaching at the institutional or department level, but not necessarily at the individual level. So it means there is freedom within a certain department or a certain fa faculty of university to have people that are, have a stronger task in teaching, others have a stronger task in research. So that is a, a flexible model. And we have the independence model claiming no functional relation between one and the other, and even proposing that it is better to separate them. 
A discussion about advantage and disadvantage of these different uh, models have prevailed in many publications, in many discussions, and governance of higher education. There are some interesting uh, uh, literature on this. I indicate here one, and uh, for those who would like to have it, we can have it afterwards. Anyway, the, 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 the principle that is uh, here important is, therefore, the union between teaching and, and Research And the second principle is the intellectual freedom in research and teaching. And the key principle of von Humboldt is that this, uh, in fact, these two uh, ideas, uh, the idea of freedom, of intellectual freedom, is anchored in Western philosophical tradition. So I just make a small uh, intermezzo, let's say, by uh, pointing out how does this come about. And this uh, picture that maybe many people know who it is, it was Erasmus, Erasmus of Rotterdam, painted by Holbein. And there's Erasmus, 1466, 1536, is a precursor of modern intellectual freedom and the fool of dogmatism. He was against the dogmatism of all churches, of the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. So that's really a, an important achievement at that time. And, uh, and the second one is my preferred philosopher, and that is Baruch Spinoza who was at the same time Portuguese and Dutch, which I feel uh, very comfortable about. And, uh, and I just quote one uh, sentence from him. The highest activity a human being can attain is learning for understanding, because to understand is to be free. And, uh, and that is all about. So if you will tell the students, I mean, why they have to understand, it's because this is really the way to achieve freedom. And uh, in this context, I'd like to mention one thing that just came to my mind when I was hearing uh, <coughs> Professor Colini um, about ownership, ownership of universities. I think a nice example is that uh, in, in, the, in the Dutch uh, Republic history, uh, there was some troubles, as you probably know, between the, the, the Spanish uh, Habsburg family and the Dutch uh, people. And uh, one city, the city of Leiden, was, um, was encircled by the Spanish troops for many years, and there was a lot of famine and hunger and, and diseases, and, uh, and there was nothing that people could use to, to hit themselves. It was terrible. Afterwards, they were liberated. And the first thing that, uh, that uh, the Prince of Orange, who was the liberator, let's say, asked the people in Leiden was, what you'd like to compensate for all this suffering that you have had? And they said, we want to have one university. So the ownership there is really the ownership of the people. Anyway, of course, things have changed since. But uh, still, I think it's interesting to think about it. So I'd like to go on a little bit more in the, in the, in the practical uh, aspects of the landscape of research universities in Europe and the role of the League of European Research Universities, which is probably not so well known in general, but I would like to give you some idea about what they represent. So uh, in, uh, in uh, April 2001, a uh, number of rectors came together in a meeting actually in, in, in the United States uh, where they thought that it would be a good idea to start something like this. It was in inter on the interest of universities that research was going to be really put forward. And there were four rectors. Uh, and they, well, the universities are represented here. So the University of Cambridge, the University of Oxford, and also the University of Leiden and the University of Leuven, or Louvain, if you like, in Belgium. And they started an initiative to get together to promote research in research universities and to defend research in research universities. Already there, there was this idea that this had to be preserved, that it had to be fostered. And they uh, took uh, the initiative. They uh, found uh, another uh, num a number of, uh, of other universities, Edinburgh, Geneva, Heidelberg, Helsinki, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, the University of the Studio di Milano, the Ludwig Wilhelmibius Universität in München, and the University of Louis Pasteur in Strasbourg. And uh, this was 2002. And then in, uh, a, a few years later, uh, this was open to other universities, and nowadays in, there are 21 universities in this League of European Research Universities. And the University of Amsterdam uh, uh, and, uh, joined uh, the Freiburg and the uh, University College London, Lund's University, the University of Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris, uh, West Paris Sud, and West of Utrecht and West of Zurich. So these, are the these constitute the League of Research Universities at this moment in Europe. 
So um, to, um, to say, I mean, something about what is now uh, considered to be a research university, it should be comprehensive. Uh, uh, so it should have different faculties with different uh, areas of knowledge. Um, that should be research intensive, okay? It should have top quality. Uh, but some more specialized uh, 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 universities can also be members, and one of them is the Imperial College London, which was also um, uh, joined in 2010. Well, um, the candidates for membership of this league have a strong research base, as I said, covering a wide range of fields of knowledge, and uh, it's very important to focus the multidisciplinarity and the cross-fertilization that we want to achieve between research areas. Uh, bibliometric analysis, already this was touched a little bit now and then, and um, they play a role, of course, in identifying potential members, but they have to be used with great care but, uh, because they have to be complemented by other information and used judiciously, which is not always the case, I would say, and uh, keep always in mind that uh, what lies behind the numbers, so uh, numbers is not the whole. And um, rankings, that is even worse. Um, uh, maybe improper, properly used, I mean, they can have some, some interest, but uh, uh, my opinion is that to describe a university in a global level with the number is, uh, should be disregarded. And uh, on the issue of university ranking systems, the, the League of uh, Research Universities also noted and uh, assumed the position that it is absurd to express the quality of such a complicated and diverse organization as a university in a single number. Um, it should also be based that, uh, it should also be stressed that, uh, that bibliometric analyses are very different for different scientific fields. Those in the natural science and the life sciences publish mostly journal articles. Engineers publish journal articles also, but many confer conference proceedings and patent reports. And uh, it's social scientists and humanities scholars focus on journal articles, book chapters, essays, monographs, etc. Uh, those working in arts, like uh, art, music, uh, dance, drama, architecture, they produce creations, artifacts that imply other evaluation approaches. So bibliometric analysis does not hold for all fields. That's quite obvious. But most important is to keep in mind what Albert Einstein said. Not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. Okay? Do you agree with that? <laughs> yes. Well, who disagrees with Albert Einstein? I mean, anyway, you see, I mean, but uh, you know, I mean, the whole thing of bibliometric analysis is, 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 is in this sentence. So you can count things, okay? But it not necessarily be things that should be counted. And uh, not everything that can be counted counts, okay? So that's, that's the point. Anyway, so I'd like now to go a little bit more in detail about what the research university really is. And uh, so, I mean, being uh, also a little bit engineering uh, uh, background, I would say, well, let's make a flow chart. And say, well, we have number one, so on the top there on the right, you have the research or graduate schools. Let's start there. Because that's where, where the incubator is. That's where the, the students come in that will become members of, uh, of, of research field, the research uh, community in general. Then, of course, there are committees, which I'm not going to talk about. That's uh, very boring. Then we have the second point, which is the university staff. What is the university staff, really? How do you, how do you, uh, how do you recruit the university staff? So the research university as a whole, and then this whole story of accountability and of assessment. So these are the points I would like to discuss now in the next few minutes. So to start with the research of graduate schools. Well, um, this... Uh, uh, quoting from one paper, actually, that was produced by the League, um, that um, there are several papers published there. One of the things is that the training of doctoral graduates is at the heart of the mission of research-intensive universities. And um, so I think this is, is an important uh, point to stress uh, because it, it just means, I mean, that you have to, 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 to develop methods, I mean, to educate researchers and to give them the possibility of... Uh, of, um, of, of development. And um, uh, how can you do this? You can do this by means of, uh, of, uh, of, of strong uh, research culture environment, quality assurance, if you like, um, to scrutinize and enhance the culture 
that is uh, fostering research and all the research activities that are associated with that. And um, in order to achieve this, it is uh, advisable to constitute networks of graduate schools often involving different faculties and universities to cover adequately a given scientific field of knowledge. You have to get critical mass. I mean, so one professor is not a critical mass. You have to have combinations and multidisciplinary uh, approaches are important. So this is the, the typical scheme where you say, well, you have to start by, by defining quite clear what are the expectations of all the actors. What do you expect, I mean, from a PhD uh, uh, career, let's say? What does the doctoral candidate expect? What do the supervisors expect? What does the departments expect? What are external partners eventually also expect? That you have to be very clear about. And then, of course, you have the scrutiny process. You have to have some measurements of, of accomplishment, of course, of people. And you have feedback mechanisms all the time. Because it's very important, I mean, that, that uh, during the whole procedure, feedback mechanisms are working in both directions. It's only one, this uh, arrow is only in one direction, but in fact, it should be bidirectional. So what are the general principles, I mean, to, to account, I mean, for the good practice of, uh, of research uh, um, education, research, education of researchers? Doctoral candidates should be the drivers of their project, including taking the responsibility of their project. This is a very, a very important point, which is very often forgotten. In many places, you know, we think that the supervisor is the driver. Here, the, 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 the supervisor the initiator may be, but the driver must be the student. And even, I mean, in many cases, even from the very beginning could be the student. That could come even from outside, I mean, and enter into the system. Then the second point, programs should be developed in a strong research environment. Because, I mean, people have to, 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 to learn from examples. And examples are given by r role models. And role models are the scientists and the researchers and the teachers. Candidates should have the opportunity to cross boundaries of disciplines. So not just to keep on one, one very strict discipline, but, I mean, to be open. It's not necessarily, it's, no, it's not a necessity, but it is actually the, uh, the opportunity of going across boundaries. Programs should encourage work contacts also outside the university, even outside the country. Very good practice. I mean, is that a student doing PhD would spend three months, six months in another university, in another town, in another, another culture. It's very op important to open these uh, this, uh, perspectives. And then the last point, programs should help candidates to make links beyond academ academia. So, I mean, that they will have also social responsibility and will be able, I mean, to participate in social life, not only just uh, doing a piece of research that will uh, end up with one or two papers. So this was what I wanted to say about graduate schools. I could say a lot more because I have been involved in the Holland uh, with uh, the accreditation of, of research schools for the beginning. And, um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that here in Porto, but probably another occasion. So now I'd like to tell, say something about how you, you recruit university staff. And, uh, and that uh, one thing that is extremely important, I think, is the post-doc university career. So the called tenure track record. Um, this is still a point that is sometimes uh, controversial. Uh, but it is important and a key factor in, uh, in, uh, for successful research and research-based teaching is to attract the best and most creative minds to the universities and support them in a nourishing and challenging environment. So you have to, to, to give the possibility of these people to have some kind of career inside uh, academia. And, um, and that's why the concept of tenure track is a, is a key tool for attracting and keeping the brightest minds at an early career stage in Europe research universities. It's actually also a standpoint of the League of Research Universities. Terry Turk is defined uh, as being the fixed term contract that, uh, uh, that is advertised with the perspective of a permanent position at a higher level than the people that are applying have. Not the same level, but a higher level. So it makes a promotion. And that is different from so-called probation on the job, which is fixed term contract with the prospect of permanent academic position, but at the same level. There's a, there's a, a slight difference between these two things, which makes all all, all, the, all the real difference. <clears throat> this is applied in some universities anyway. 
So and the thing that is also important for the university staff as a general is that the total number of positions available at any level from the, from the assistant to the junior lecturer, to the senior lecturer, to the reader, to the, to the, to the professor should be flexible, avoiding bottlenecks and the, that in the, in the staff pyramid. And in fact, even better is to have no pyramid at all so that the structure would be a much more a flat structure than a pyramidal structure. <clears throat> so challenges now. I have to single out two challenges. One is that research may gradually become detached from teaching. Um, so that is um, one important problem for this called integrationist model, which we can maybe call the conventional wisdom model, uh, where you expect, I mean, that people are at the same time, at the same time have a teaching uh, uh, and a research activity in the same structure. And this is the, the model that I think is most uh, important. But nowadays, uh, many uh, uh, academics observe a tendency for political influences to, to change the nexus between research and teaching, creating teaching only staff positions. It tends to hire temporary staff to teach. And um, I think this is, uh, is a danger. Uh, but um, I would say it's a challenge. Maybe it's not necessarily a danger, it depends on the circumstances. And, um, but what's important now is that we have to think about this. We have to think about the pros and cons about this, 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 this development and, uh, and to, to uh, apply it in a, in a very, very, very well thought way. It is, cannot be any kind of automatism. But it's a, it's a, a real challenge. And we feel that in, in, in our university in Amsterdam, and I think probably you will feel that everywhere. Um, there are some interesting studies about that also that you can read maybe. Um, the other challenge we'd like to, to stress is about the market-oriented research. Um, so again, I mean, in the, the research level, we have uh, also the, 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 the public uh, funding agents that are putting pressure on universities to be more intertwined with economic and commercial institutions, stimulating university, industry, technology transfer. There's nothing wrong about that. I think what is important here is to think well about it and what are the consequences. Uh, many of these initiatives seek to spur economic development based on university research, for example, by creating science parks. We have one in Amsterdam, where I, I have a, a, my office, located nearby research university campuses, supporting business incubators and uh, public seed capital funds, uh, organizational other forms of bridging institutions that are believed to link universities to industrial innovation. Uh, I'd like to, to concretize this question by uh, uh, mentioning one thing which is not perhaps so well known. It is the Bay Dole Act of the United States. And this was issued in 1980 in the United States. And this was uh, an act that was allowing the creation of research partnerships between university and industry with the main objective of more rapidly bringing scientific innovations to the productive line and thus to the market. In this way, sort of research market university concept emerged. Well, this is a very important uh, uh, development which uh, permitted then for universities and those small companies and uh, non-profit organization to commercialize the results of federally funded research because this was specifically aimed at federal uh, funded uh, research institutions. Before 19, 1981, fewer than 250 patents were issued to universities each year in the United States. A decade later, universities were averaging approximately 1,000 patents a year. And this is uh, to be seen in the next graph, where you have here the time along the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is the share of uh, patents uh, granted to universities um, uh, of all domestic United States patents. And you see a big increase after the act, which was passed, as I said, in 1980. But if you look carefully to the vertical axis, you see that uh, the top of the axis point is 0.04. So it means that still the number of patents uh, issued in uh, 1999, 2000, uh, uh, for universities in, uh, in the United States is only 4% of all the patents that are issued. So a lot of others 
are coming from other sources. But still quite a number of important ones are coming from uh, these research universities. So should one apply this also to Europe? Um, there are some, declare, some discussions about that. Um, and some, uh, of course, come uh, up with, uh, with uh, the, the, the point that this will be in, uh, in, uh, in collision with the principle of the Magna Carta of European Universities, as was issued in Bologna in 1988, which stands that research and teaching must be morally, intellectually independent of all political authority and economic power. Okay. Uh, a number of European countries, however, uh, take measures and have been considering, I mean, to, to adapt these policies in different countries. I just have examples of the United Kingdom, Italy, but I mean, in, it has happened, I think, in most countries um, in this, uh, these different ways. And I think the only thing that I would like to, to conclude, I mean, from this development at this stage, is to say that this has to be carefully discussed at academic and political levels. And the uh, pros and cons adequately weighted. So it's nothing that we can say it's, it's wrong. You can say it's always okay. It depends. And depends on the conditions where this is going to be formulated. So now we we'll go to the point of the puzzles of assessment, which of course bother a lot of people at universities and also the public in general, and the nightmares of rankings, which is, uh, which is actually a nightmare. Um, now uh, this question of assessment. Assessment is of course essential. Yeah, most universities are public funded, so we have uh, it's accountability uh, to the taxpayer, let's say, to the governments, etc. And uh, you have to, to, to do it in a proper way. The rationale for assessment within the university can be summarized as follows, at least in the view that uh, I share with the League of Research Universities. There should be rigorously gauged research output quality and impact that's ensuring future allocation of funds to improve performance. To provide the academic community with an opportunity to receive international peer feedback, enabling identification of strengths and weaknesses. To recruit, retain, and <clears throat> reward top performers, identify and track individual accomplishments. To track and possibly reward departments or faculties for exceptional performance and leadership and to find and foster productive collaborations, including international ones. So these are six points, which five points, which I think are essential. The main foundation of the assessment methodology are peer review, if conflicts of interest are prevented. Bibliometrics, if correctly interpreted, which is not always the case. An impacted reputation among peers and scientific community if the process of gathering information is properly carried out. It's not enough, I mean, to send a couple of emails to, I mean, to your friends somewhere in, a, in another country and ask them to judge your, your research uh, university, since you, if you do that nicely, you will be also rewarded with a similar letter in the other direction. Well, that is not, uh, the, not uh, a good practice, of course. In short, assessment implies a lot of common sense in avoiding being mesmerized by rankings. So I think that uh, we should be very clear about that, at least uh, to be very clear. Anyway, I mean, I have here one graph which I took from one of the publications of the League of um, Justices about the United Kingdom, showing, I mean, all the influence of the research assessment exercise of 1986, uh, now it's called Research Excellence Framework in, uh, in, in England, United Kingdom, but I think it is in England, yes, uh, where vertically you have the number or the share of number of citations, I mean, in the world, and the horizontal you have the time. And you see, I mean, this was introduced at 86. Then you had, I think, I don't know, I mean, my English colleagues may, may be uh, able to explain that to me. They have a dip. Uh, I think that, that was some kind of anxiety re reaction, I mean, to this uh, fun exercise. And then, of course, it starts to increase. And um, so to show, I mean, that this has some effect in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the production of, <coughs> of research that is, uh, uh, that has impact measured in this way. <coughs> this the source is the Higher Education Funding Council for England, and UK is available at several places. So uh, now I come to pondering about the difference in performance between universities that belong and universities that do not belong to, the, to this uh, league domain. Uh, since I have little time, I will be a little bit short about that. 
Um, and um, and uh, I would f finally would say something about what I think is necessary for a university to reach the research intensive level and eventually to be candidate to be member of the League of Research Universities. And, um, and so in this way, I would say that uh, we are in Oslo Porto, so of course we'd like to discuss this also, I think, for the people in here to, to ponder about these things. Um, as I said, I'm not going to give you any, any numbers. I had some tables that I may offer to you to, to consult. I'd just like to go a little bit uh, to, the, to the main point here, which is to the five critical points. And the five critical points are, for me are the following. The first is the basic requirement for a high-level research or training is to place training programs in research environment of outstanding quality. This can best be achieved in research or graduate schools with appropriate accreditation and preferably within the framework of inter-university collaborations with sufficient critical mass, which uh, is not always the case. Second, to apply demanding selection procedures for the appointment of staff members based on strong scientific performance of individuals and acknowledged teaching expertise and value both sides of the coin. Third, to establish flexible postdoc and tenure track careers based on individual capacities in research and teaching, avoiding inbreeding. Fourth, to concentrate resources in research fields having the potential of achieving recognized international leadership, creating environments where people can actively engage in exploring novel ideas, even if this may appear as outliers. I think you have to, to, to foster outliers, not to, to, to eliminate them. And in this way, I think also important to note that, um, that um, to concentrate resources is a very, very important thing to do because not every university can be excellent in everything. And uh, also the same applies, of course, for the different universities in a country like Portugal. And fifth, to apply multifactorial systems of research financing, including those emerging from industry uh, interactions, with patent licensing, spin-offs, contract research, information outputs. I think we'll hear much more about it tomorrow or the day after tomorrow from Graham Williams, so, but keeping high standards of intellectual freedom. So that is something that I think we should always keep in mind. And I uh, have here a map of Europe with the different uh, research universities that, and other universities plot. Um, I just leave it for, you can find it in the Times High uh, Education educa Supplement. And um, this was what I would like to tell you today. Thank you so much. I think the, um, your lecture was uh, indeed very good and it gives us plenty to think about uh, for our university as well. So, um, Claudio, if you have any thoughts on this, please. Okay, first of all, uh, I have thoughts. Uh, I have had thoughts, so I did actually wrote my thoughts. I didn't know exactly what uh, Professor Fernando Lopez da Silva will was going to talk about, but he gave us, uh, he gave us some clues with his abstracts. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to bear with me. Uh, I have a few minutes. Uh, I will try to be brief, but I thought that uh, what I actually prepared was uh, perhaps should have been done before his talk. He was very specific. He was very uh, to the point, and I, I thought of it in a more uh, uh, like philosophical way and on, on a more general way and historical way to view this, this, this issue of the, of the research university. So if you, if you bear, I'll, I'll, I'll read uh, and I'll do this as fast as possible. So I would like to thank the rector for the, for the invitation and congratulate him on the organization of these events because as scientists, thinking the future, I think is what we should be doing constantly. I would also like to acknowledge Professor Lopez da Silva, a distinguished neuroscientist, who has made enormous contributions to this field, but he's also contributed generously to the development of science in Portugal over many years. I do remember him during the first evaluation, I think it was 1966, that was so important for the development of science in Portugal. What I uh, was asked to do was to comment on the general topic of research universities changing uh, challenges and dilemmas. 
I think, first of all, we, we should go back a little bit more into the uh, definition of what a research university is and a little bit of what a history of the last, uh, let's say, 50 years or so uh, tell us. So while universities are really some of the oldest institutions that have survived since the Middle Ages, actually most of the universities that we know as uh, and, uh, other academic institutions that we know nowadays were established in the last century, and in fact, most of them after the Second World War. Since the end of the Second World War, there's been a growing demand to widen access to higher education and change the elitist nature of all universities. This had led to a massive increase in higher education across all continents during the late 20th, 20th century and during the early stages of the 21st century. Just to give you some numbers, by 2000, there were approximately 100 million students in higher education, representing about 20% of the relevant age cohort worldwide. Where at the start of the 20th century, there was only 500,000 students enrolled in higher education. Nowadays, a number of countries have achieved admission rates of higher education over 50% of the age cohort. This enrollment growth has created huge pressure on national governments in trying to cope with the various problems associated with the expansion of higher education boundaries, and most particularly with the structures. Structures of higher education have remained high on the agendas of policymakers, and most particularly in economic developed countries. For more than four decades since the 60s and 70s, the view spread in economically advanced countries that the expansion of higher education would be essential for economic growth, and I remind you economic growth, not necessarily social progress, two different things. Also with the expansion of the middle classes, college education became a ticket to social and economic mobility. Thus, over the 30 years, these enormous pressures on the system has, in my view, created and crystallized into what I call a dual system of higher education. During the period of expansion, the vast majority of the institutions fully embraced the growth of student numbers. But as a consequence, over the past years, they have realized that while excelling in teaching could be possibly maintained, the most individualized, practice-based research training suffered immensely. The fusion that existed up to 1970, 1980 in the last century, where student numbers were small and the number of teaching and research staff were very high, created a, almost an individual tutorial system like that operating in the UK, but clearly could not longer be sustained. Thus, over the last 20 years or so, this has resulted in this, this dual system of teaching and research universities, which in many cases is quite separate. Not that teaching universities don't do research, but that the teaching universities can never really aspire to achieve the level of research carried out in the context of research universities. So one might ask, and I think we, we saw what a research university is. And clearly, a research university are universities where the main focus is promoting research by professors and graduate students and not the teaching of undergraduates. This university are less oriented toward mass, mass undergraduate teaching and the other great graduate teaching they do, <clears throat> they do provide does come at a huge financial cost since they maintain a very small number of students and work most, mostly on the basis of the very in individualized learning experience. In some sense, they recapitulate all style universities with respect to undergraduates. As a matter of comparison and to get you an idea of the cost that required to maintain in that individualized university, just to give you that idea, and I think it's important, these comparisons, but with the right numbers, University of Harvard has a total of 21,000 students, 70% of those students are graduates, and it has an annual budget of 4.4 billion US dollars. University of Oxford has a total of 22,000 students, 50% of which are graduate students, with an annual budget of 1.4 billion US dollars. And the University of Porto has a total of 31,000 students, with only 20% of them being graduate students, with an annual budget of about 220 million euros uh, currently. Therefore, this, over this period of 30 years or so, we have seen on the one hand professionalization of teaching, of which the US system is a clear example, with colleges representing a large number of this, this institution, and where research is only marginal. And on the other ones, we have seen a number of institutions that are trying to maintain a system in which research 
postgraduate training dominates over undergraduates. In Portugal, the massification of education took place in the 80s and 90s. And it's only very recently that universities have begun to question the role in teaching and research and how to harmonize these two essentially opposite aspects that actually compete for limited resources. Accordingly, the theoretical teaching can still cope with this expansion, but it is clear that practical teaching and research based learning has suffered. However, universities that realize these competing aspects could jeopardize their future and leadership have on the one hand professionalized research within the staff and on the other have embraced the whole heartily masters, PhDs and postdoctoral programs uh, within the research based system exactly as uh, Professor Fernando da Silva said. So most importantly research universities are no longer really a single entity but in fact a collection of research institutes that under the umbrella of a university label collaborate in the main objecti objective which is to do world class research and train the future leaders in research through masters, PhDs and postdoctoral programs. Given the split in higher education system, non-research based universities have begun to realize that expansion of the undergraduate student population came at the expense of achieving excellence in research, limiting their access to competitive funding, to the most qualified staff, and to some extent to the best students. How did universities like the University of Porto or many other universities in Portugal react to these situations? Well, given the opportunity and the expansion of the research-based system in Portugal, what we saw was the creation of research institutions affiliated to the universities that were partly independent and which were able to hire dedicated research staff. They also took the challenge of getting involved in masters, PhDs, and postdoctoral program, programs. In some sense, they became mini research universities, allowing the staff to concentrate most of their effort in research and in the practice-based learning of a very small number of students. The general outcome of this system has actually been a major success in their ability to attract funds, outstanding students, and research staff, and contributed significantly to the recent development of the national system of technology in Portugal. So the question that I would like to leave is, is it, whether, is it, possible, uh, is it possible within these universities to accommodate both mass teaching and undergraduates of undergraduate students so as to fulfill their social mission and at the same time to carry out top level research? I think in my view, the answer is clearly no. Or at least it is not possible to have the same staff pursuing both types of mission at the same time. So the answer is no qualified. So what are the alternatives for the Portuguese systems to resolve a dilemma and define the future strategy? I think the, the only way I can currently see this happening is that it is essential that universities fully embrace the research institutions that have been set up over the last 20 years within the perimeter and that nowadays provide a significant part of the research based system, as well as masters, PhDs, and postdoctoral programs. These research institutions, together with more classical faculties and departments, need to become a central aspect of the life of the university, which through a system of flexible teaching load, I think you referred to that, a flexible research load over time could allow them to accommodate both needs. One could imagine research institutes and university departments as two aspects of the same institution that can exchange faculty, allowing mobility of academic staff or even non-academic staff. Teach both undergraduates and postgraduates and select the most outstanding students so that they can pursue at the right time a more individualized practice-based learning. Accordingly, research institutes, together with the faculties and departments, should take integrated decisions and think their future collectively to maintain excellence in teaching at all levels, but also encourage top-level research. Just to finish, it is now very clear that the national system of science and technology in Portugal has developed immensely over the last 20 years. This has allowed its international recognition in a wide variety of fields, and I don't think that anybody really disputes that. But perhaps is now the time to reposition this system together with the institutions of higher education into a new paradigm of integration and collaboration that could clearly benefit both systems. Thank you very much.